Hello, so it looks like the first couple slides from my talk got cut off for whatever reason at Stanford. So I'm going to, um, I'll just go through them myself um, here on the computer and then I'll kind of transition over to the rest of my talk. Thanks for watching. Okay, so this is uh, emergency medicine, of course, because I love puns and digital tools that disrupt the specialty. So I like to talk about, uh, you know, they talk about disruptive technology, things that are kind of changing and forcing us to change the way that we that we uh, live in our world and that frequently force us and force industries to improve and do a better job with things. Um, but, you know, this is Stanford. Everyone here is so nice. So I figured I'd change this from disrupt to improve. And that sounds so much nicer. And that's me. Uh, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start with a little history lesson and then some of other assorted tales and um, examples. Uh, I'm going to talk then about the history of the old way that ideas and information, especially medical information, has been disseminated throughout the ages, and now this new way that um, a lot of us are doing things, and I think uh, you should uh, you should try it as well. And um, and then I'm going to talk about a bunch of resources that are currently available. Uh, everything that I talk about today, except I think one uh, one app is completely free and completely available today for you to start using. Um, I'm going to give some examples of how I use these digital tools in my daily practice as an emergency physician for both patient care and for teaching. And then I'm going to talk about where I really think things are going. A couple disclosures. I do do mdcalc.com, which is a medical calculations and algorithms website. And I, you know, I make a little bit of money. We have some ads on the side. We have an iPhone app coming out shortly. But um, I'm not going to talk about um, mdcalc uh, today. Um, the nnt.com is a uh, evidence-based medicine website where we try to summarize the best evidence for a bunch of different therapies. We just started a diagnostic section. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, this is also completely free to use, and um, anybody can use it. I will mention that briefly at the at the end of the talk. To start out, this is uh, this is my Tumblr blog, G Emergency, because again I like puns. But so every link that I um, that I mention in this talk, every paper that I that I uh, have kind of pulled a screenshot from or a, um, a capture from is all referenced on um, on a post uh, here, so you don't have to necessarily write anything down. You can just go to the blog and um, and click on the links that you want. Okay, so it obviously sounds like I'm going to be talking about technology today, but really, this talk is really more about information, and specifically how information and ideas move over time. So how things started out in really in the 1600s in medicine um, and moved to the 1800s and now... Um, to today and how information is moving and the speed at which it's moving particularly. So talking about um, ideas moving and sharing ideas, this is a meme, this is an internet meme. So uh, these are frequently pictures or images or videos that one person um, has liked and then has been shared and manipulated and changed and spread through, um, in this case, Twitter, um, other blogs, Facebook, um, and people kind of co-opt them and make them their own. So this was uh, from a television show called Game of Thrones that I really like. And this character says, one does not simply play the Game of Thrones. So somebody, nobody really, I don't think any know, knows who did this, but somebody liked this idea of one does not simply and took this character's picture and said, okay, well, my favorite here is one does not simply turn left in San Francisco, which you'll find funny if you've ever driven... Um, in San Francisco, it's almost impossible to make a left turn on a lot of the major streets there. Um, and so I've taken this uh, and uh, applied it to my talk. So I've, um, again, shared and manipulated the information, made it my own. So one does not simply keep current by reading annals. Um, and I will, uh, I'll now transition to my Beams actual talk. And Thanks for watching. Talk. So um, one does not simply keep current by reading annals. So my idea for this talk, since, you know, Gus emailed me and said, oh, do you want to do Grand Rounds? And I said, oh, that'd be great. Uh, and I thought, oh, what do people talk about in Grand Rounds? And they, they talk about what they're experts at. And I was like, well, I'm a new attending. I'm not really an expert at anything, um, but I'm an expert at being new. And then I'm, I, I do do a lot of stuff. <laughs> I do do a lot of stuff um, on kind of social media and, and online resources, and I probably have an addiction issue with internet, but there are worse addiction issues, and so that's okay. Um, but one of these ideas was, what do I do now that I'm done with residency? That, um, 
that I don't have to go to journal clubs anymore. I don't have an attending telling me I have to read things. I don't have to study for the in-service exam. I have to take my boards. But, but after that, I can go out and practice however I want. And you guys will realize, you third years who are about to graduate, it's a little scary the first time you get your critically ill patient and it's just you and the nurse. And there's nobody looking over your shoulder to make sure you're interpreting the EKG right, that you're knowing the right dosage of the medicines to give. And so how do you know that you're gonna be practicing differently in 20 years than today? Um, and so how do you keep up with the information um, that, that we're learning? Uh, and so I wanna give a couple examples. We're gonna talk about um, some old white surgeons and germ theory to start out with. So this is the history lesson. So this is Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1843. He talks about purple sepsis and he says, God, all these pregnant women are dying, uh, and they seem to be dying after people are doing an exam on them. They seem to then spike a fever and get sick and frequently die. Mortality was around 18, 20% of childbirth at the time. So that's 1843. And I, I always hated dates, but I'll show you why they, they kind of matter. So this is uh, Semmelweis, he's a Hungarian uh, surgeon. He, uh, in 1847, comes up with this idea that, hey, he's gonna make his students wash his hands and wash their hands in chlorine before they examine a pregnant woman. He drops the mortality rate from 18% in this hospital to 1%. That's an NNT of five, by the way. Um, so he, he makes, a mer I mean, 18% to 1%, nothing that we do today besides maybe cardioversion for, uh, or defibrillation for VFib arrest, almost nothing else is that good, 18 to 1% mortality. Uh, this is Lister, so Listerine, uh, and uh, Joseph Lister actually comes up with the idea in 1867. He publishes this paper. Uh, there we go, a antiseptic principle in the practice of surgery. He publishes this in the BMJ, and this is actually online. The BMJ has republished this so you can read it. It's a fascinating read. Um, publishes it in 1867 and starts talking about um, sterilizing instruments, starts talking about using aseptic practice, and he actually uses, um, i trying to remember, uh, he uses phenol and makes, their, makes surgeons wash their hands and their instruments before operating. So then, so 1867, 1876, Lister comes to the U.S. and starts talking to William Halstead. William Halstead's a surgeon at Bellevue, and he's trying to convince people, hey, listen to, my, listen to me, read my article about aseptic technique, it will really save people's lives. And, it, and uh, Halstead doesn't actually start listening to him really until 1884. So for... Uh, for a number of years, Lister isn't really even um, listened to, at least in the U.S. Finally, in 1884, Halstead starts to um, uh, take note and listen to him due to this guy, Robert Koch. So Koch comes up with Koch's postulates, if you remember biology, and those are the postulates that, that kind of prove when a microorganism causes a particular disease. He proved this in anthrax first. Um, but so it's not until 1884 that Halstead starts doing that stuff, and it's, not be, and it's only because Koch in 1882 publishes publishes these postulates that try to kind of um, encourages Halstead to, to give this whole aseptic technique um, a practice. So Halstead starts doing this in 1884. He doesn't operate in the theater, the surgical theaters um, of Bellevue. He goes outside. He makes a tent. He boils all of his instruments. He sterilizes everything. He starts using rubber gloves um, as a requirement of all, anybody who's gonna be scrubbed into his surgery um, because he believes in this aseptic technique. And then uh, there's a couple more advancers. Gustav Neuber in 1883 uh, adds, um, uh, makes the, develops a sterile, the idea of a sterile field. He also requires that everybody that's scrubbing in wear caps and gowns. And then uh, Jan uh, Mukulitz is a Polish surgeon and he then requires that uh, they also wear surgical masks. So that's the first time there were ever surgical masks um, in the operating room in 1897. So you look through all these numbers. So purple sepsis, 1843 to 1897, this is 54 years of people dying because nobody really wants to listen to people and that even with, even with these, um, these papers getting published in 1867, people aren't really listening to them for a very long period of time. Lister, even though it's published, Lister has to go to the US to start talking to American surgeons because nobody really believes him. So it's 54 years. So now this is a story about the more recent, um, the more recent, uh, more recent times. So this is a paper called Pre-Oxygenation, Re-Oxygenation and the Delayed Sequence Intubation in the Emergency Department. Scott Weingart, who we'll talk about a little bit later, is an emergency physician at Mount Sinai. He's also a critical care physician. He does a, a, a critical care podcast. And he comes up with this idea that, hey, maybe hypoxic patients, we shouldn't just be trying to quickly 
do RSI, rapid sequence intubation, and intubate them. That hypoxia is a bad outcome for already hypoxic patients. They're going to have an anoxic brain injury. They're going to do worse. So how can we pre-oxygenate them better? They're frequently combative. They're agitated. What can we do? So he comes up with this idea that, well, maybe we should put them on BiPAP. We can give them almost much closer to 100% FiO2. We can give them PEEP. And let's give them some ketamine. The ketamine chills them out. They don't freak out. They don't they're not agitated anymore about their level of hypoxia, and you can better pre them, and then you intubate them once you've put them on BiPAP for a couple of minutes. So uh, I'll go back to this. Uh, so Scott, um, Scott gets this idea, and I, I, I talked to Scott about this, uh, in 2010. He publishes this um, in, uh, in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. It gets accepted for publication here in April of 2010. So he'd written an article sometime in about January, probably. But if you actually look at the publication date, so that's June 2011. So it's been e-published, which if you've, if, you've, uh, if you've been accepted for publication now, that's the thing. You've been e-published. You can go on the journal's website and download the article. But it's not in print for another, for in this case, almost a year and a half. So Scott, like I said, does this podcast. And so this is now January 2011. He's been e-pubbed for eight, nine months, and he decides, well, I'm just going to start talking about this. So in January 2011, he starts talking about this delayed sequence intubation, and he publishes it in a podcast. And then later, uh, later that year, he finally, t uh, he actually talks about it uh, just at, in San Francisco at ASAP this year. So um, I, I talked to Scott about this, and he said, oh, well, yeah, I didn't hear anything when I got e-published. Nobody was talking about this. Nobody corresponded with me. Three weeks after he published in his podcast, people were trying this. People were giving him suggestions of what to do differently, what worked in their hospital that might not work in his place because they have different resources and the hospitals work in different ways. So he's already getting feedback, already improving this technique. This is um, even a more recent example. So this is three weeks, actually three weeks ago, I think today, this is when the interns were doing their disaster scenario. So this is April 25th, okay? So uh, this is another story. This is about, this is all Twitter. Okay, so there's a number of us who interact kind of on Twitter as in a, mostly just on a professional basis, talking about different studies and things. So Seth Truger is a friend of mine. He's a chief resident at Mount Sinai. Uh, and he, his brother-in-law um, has a morbidly obese patient with a pneumothorax, and he has to put in a chest tube. And so his brother-in-law has this idea to use a bougie and then use his Seldinger technique to put in the chest tube so to make sure that once he pops that hole into the chest wall, he, the, when he's trying to re then put in the chest tube, it doesn't wrap around just the subcutaneous fat of the of the you know very large patient that actually goes into the uh, into the chest cavity, um, and so Seth Seth talks about this. His attending Scott Weingart says, "Oh, I don't, really? Are you sure that works? I feel like the bushy is going to be too short for a chest tube." Um, and uh, another emergency physician, this is literally about two or three minutes later, says, oh, no, they make really long bougies. This will definitely work. And Scott says, hey, to kind of everyone who follows him on Twitter, hey, anybody who's working in the ED today, can you just take a picture? I'm just curious what this looks like. So about five minutes later, there's a picture. This is from Hennepin County in Minnesota. Um, and there, somebody's working there that day, and he, they shoot a picture, and there's the, there, clearly it, it would work. Um, so Michelle Lynn, then about five minutes later, who just talked here a couple weeks ago, says, awesome photo, mind if I credit you and, and put this into a trick of the trade for my blog. And this is, of course, now in between our disaster scenarios. We're already set up, we're ready to go, the interns are debriefing, and I, of course, want to get credit, too, for this. And so um, I'm in the sim lab, and there's a bougie, and there's a chest tube in there, and so I take some pictures of the actual procedure going into the patient, going into the, the mannequin that, of course, already had a chest tube hole in it. Um, and then, uh, so then Chris Nixon, who is now an emergency physician in Australia, about 20 minutes later, he says, oh, this is a great idea. I added this to uh, my blog, and I'm going to talk about his blog a little bit later. So now 30 minutes later, there's now a blog post, best use for a bougie, and talking about this whole discussion. Three days later, it's now on Michelle Lynn's blog, and people are talking about it. People are trying this technique of the Seldinger chest tube using bougie, and just for humor's sake, of course. So they had initially talked about, it. if there's a hole, it's worth sticking a bougie in it. And I said, oh, well, I do bougie-assisted rectal exams. OK, so um, you know, there's this idea that how do you keep up with everything that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get back to here, um, and that just, you know, 
I, I hate to say this third years, but when you graduate, you know, there's not a magic wand that gets waved on you and you're now an attending, you're all knowing, you're still, you know as much or as little as when you graduated. Okay, so a little more history. So this is Acta Philosophica, uh, sorry, Acta Medica Philosophica Hafniniusia. I don't know, if I tried to pronounce that multiple times. So all of this information started out in the 1600s and people started talking about journals and publishing things together. This is thought to be the first medical uh, publication. It did have some, um, some veterinary stuff in it as well, but if you notice it's by Bartholini, who's Bartholins, who not only discovered the Bartholins glands, but also the entire lymphatic system. Um, and these all started from scientific societies that initially were just like uh, kind of a bunch of scientists hanging out and who were interested in the same thing. They were initially informal gatherings of people and then they decided to make them formal medical societies. And then um, they you know, would have these scientific meetings today. Now what is the ASAP Scientific Assembly, right? That um, you, have, uh, you have people that can talk about their research, you have experts in the field lecturing to large audiences to discuss their, um, their findings. So this is the medical repository. This is the first American medical journal. Um, this was back in the uh, 1797, this was first published. Anybody know what this is? The Boston Medical and Surgical Journal? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is in the 1830s this is published, and then about 1923 this merges and then becomes the New England Journal of Medicine. So then CME, CME is a much more recent concept. I actually don't know a whole lot about it because once you graduate from residency, when you're taking your boards, that actually counts for your CME. But you have to do a number of credits to prove that you're keeping up with, with the specialty, with the literature. Um, and so this starts out, starts out in the 1900s, this Blackburn plan, this idea that, um, that there'd be evening courses that physicians could go to after they work in the hospital or work in the OR to kind of talk about their ideas and, and keep up with the keep, keep up with um, with what their, their colleagues are doing. There's not a whole lot of literature at the time. The North Carolina Extension Plan has similar ideas in the 1910s. And then I've got some interesting, uh, some interesting uh, sharing uh, technology from the 50s. So in 1951, the Indiana State Medical Association um, comes up with the idea that private telephone lines will then get networked out to all of their different um, county medical associations. And so they can now talk on the phone and hear an expert in 92 different parts of the state. And then in, in uh, 1956, the Albany Medical College starts using two-way radios so that you could radio back and forth and talk to an expert, um, you know, kind of like how we talk to, uh, to ambulances now. You can get a set of vital signs, you can ask questions to the expert in the field. So what's wrong with this system? Well, it's slow and out of date, right? Just like I talked about with, with Scott Weingart's article, you can have something EPUB that no one is reading, that no one knows anything about until it gets actually published in the journal. Um, and so you can you know, wait many, many years um, until your article gets to, gets to press. It's easy to miss relevant information. There's now tens of thousands of journals, thousands of medical journals, sub, sub, sub specialized journals. And so if you're not particularly reading every single journal, you're going to miss relevant information, especially as emergency physicians, when we are you know, expected to be experts in almost every specialty, right? Or know at least um, a, a, good, a good deal about every specialty. So that, you know, that big subarachnoid trial, it was probably the biggest and the best diagnostic subarachnoid trial. That wasn't in emergency medicine literature, that was in the BMJ. So if you were only reading every emergency medicine journal, you're still gonna miss stuff that's really important to you clinically. You don't get any feedback. So if you've ever published something, um, you'll realize that you probably have never heard anything back from people. And that's because the journals don't really have a great way, a great mechanism of getting information from, uh, from a reader to an author. Okay, so, um, and there's also this idea that, uh, that you shouldn't really contact an author directly, that all communication in a journal should be then directed to the journal as opposed to directly to the author. So there's certainly peer review concerns. Um, peer review, uh, I think, is not as, uh, as good as we uh, hoped it to be. So this is just one study, there's many like it. Qual quantitative analysis of sponsorship bias in economic studies of antidepressants. And I'll zoom to the conclusion here. Pharmacoeconomic studies of antidepressants reveal clear associations of study sponsorship with quantitative outcome. So there's certainly concerns that if you, uh, if you sponsor a study, you're more likely to A, get published, and B, that study is much more likely to have positive outcomes that, that encourage the, you know, the sale of, of that particular drug. This is a, uh, from a cancer journal. Um, yes?
industry funding into the study, exactly. So this is, um, this is uh, uh, a, um, from a cancer journal, and they're talk this is kind of a review of peer review, and I'll, uh, they talk about um, a Cochrane review, and this Cochrane review actually was a review of peer review, so it's kind of a meta review, and it's, it's Cochrane trying to see, does peer review actually make a difference? Does it actually do what we hope it to do? Which I think we would all agree is make sure good stuff gets published and reject bad stuff, yes? Is that the idea of peer review? So here's what Cochrane says, at present, little empirical evidence is available to support the use of editorial peer review as a mechanism to ensure quality of biomedical research. Not, not what you're hoping to hear. So the new. So the new is nice because you get instant gratification, right? So I can um, instantly tweet to anybody and talk to them. I can pretty much instantly download any article that I want to. I can have access to almost any resource without having to uh, wait to find it in the library, to photocopy it, to request it from another library. Um, this idea of the, the cream rising to the top. So crowdsourcing, um, if you've heard that term, essentially means that um, if you take a big quantity of people, they will help filter out and find the best material for you. If you're, if you're a member of Facebook, you'll, you'll probably see this with um, images that your friends have posted or status updates that have been posted. So the ones that get a lot of likes or that people comment on, you are then more likely to see in your own Facebook feed. And so it becomes kind of a snowball effect. So you can imagine people who are talking about a particular article, that article is gonna get read by more people, even if it's not necessarily in your specialty journal that you read. Um, there's another idea that, that I wanna to touch base on a little bit as well that's called the peripheral brain. So it's this idea um, of a couple things. This is my peripheral brain. So I don't, some of you have seen me use this um, clinically during a shift. So this is like a little private blog that I have set up. And essentially during residency, every time I read a review article, I got a pearl from an attending. Um, I, uh, I found an interesting um, uh, x-ray or CT scan. I would actually publish it and add it to this blog. Okay. So now anytime I have a question about a particular topic, I go onto this website. I search for the term I'm looking for, and it helps remind me of the information that I, I knew I had read sometime, but I couldn't exactly remember what it was. So just, uh, just a couple days ago, I had a, um, we, had, we had a sickler here, and I saw hundreds of sicklers in New York, and they're pretty rare here, and I knew there was one particular thing I, I wanted to look up about questions I needed to ask this patient with sickle cell. So I went onto the website, I typed in sickle, and I had found every single reference that I had to sickle cell. So it's a very much, it's an easier way than trying to take notes in a notebook because you lose the notebook, the notebook, uh, you know, you don't, if you don't have it with you, it's lost and, and kind of gone forever. So there's another idea that medical, medicine is getting so complex that I would hope you're not trying to memorize everything. That you shouldn't be, um, your, your job should not be to know the dose of, say, malarone for malaria, but that um, we're increasingly moving to a world where you need to know how to get to the information. So that um, you need to, there's a certain amount of information you must know, obviously, especially as emergency physicians, but there's a lot of information that if you know how to get to it, that's more important than you have knowing it off the top of your head. And so, like I said, there's some, most of this stuff is going to be always available, especially with Dropbox and more backup solutions and less, less, um, less concerns with downtime or the internet being down. Um, but there's obviously information that, especially as emergency physicians, we have to know. So this is another meme. It's called scumbag brain. And uh, this is a, a problem that you may run into. So you know Ace of Base lyrics. You know movie quotes, but what is the dose of epinephrine? So that's obviously not okay for emergency physicians, right? There are certainly certain things, mostly in critical care, that you just have to know, that you can't rely on your iPhone for, that you can't rely on a journal article or up to date for. You have to know at the bedside, you have to know immediately, and you, shouldn't, you, shouldn't, um, you should not be relying on a peripheral brain for this. So there's other problems with the new. So there's no peer review, right? Um, anybody can go on Tumblr or any blog or Twitter and just start typing things. Um, and th there's no really way to review or, or make sure that the dosages are correct, that the pathophysiology that they're talking about is correct, that anything that they are saying is true. Um, and so that's obviously a problem with this. Um, could there be a financial bias? 
could I be, uh, could Merck be paying me to talk about a drug um, and blogging about it? I guess that's possible. Um, and I guess there's, uh, there's other people who may be doing that. Um, it's certainly happening in marketing. There's certainly um, uh, social marketing people who uh, will go on a popular website and just start talking about Tide detergent or something like that. They're paid to do this. So I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't, is happening now or doesn't happen in the future. However, one of the nice things is public, uh, 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 publishing now has become so cheap, it's almost, um, it's almost free. So if you have access to a device and an internet connection, you can in five minutes start a blog, start typing anything you want online. Um, and so there's less incentive that you need some sort of monetary incentive for you to, to publish. And then there's groupthink, right? So the, the trade-off of the cream of the crop rises to the top um, modality is that you might miss unpopular but important information. So say there's an important guideline that everybody should probably know the new recommendations, but nobody's really talking about it because it's really lengthy and particularly not, not very, a not very interesting read. Uh, you may be missing that as well. Journals are here to stay. I don't think this is going to an, an all or none black and white solution. I think things are, uh, things are gonna be changing and journals are probably good for a couple things. Dissemination of guidelines and big studies. I think most of the other stuff that comes in journals right now, I think should probably and is going to move um, online. And hopefully that, that then you know, brings more room for actual studies to get published in the journals because the journals have a finite amount of, um, of space um, in, their, in their publications. I'm going to talk, um, give you some information about what resources are available. And these are resources that I, um, I certainly read all the blogs every day. I listen to the podcasts as much as I can, and I'll show you some apps and videos. Um, this stuff is absolutely incredible, and if you're not using it, I really think you should. So life in the fast lane, I'm going to talk specifically about this blog for a second because it's definitely the best emergency medicine um, blog out there. So this is done by some Australian physicians, and uh, emergency physicians and Australian nurses emergency nurses, um, and uh, it's called lifeinthefastlane.com, and it's by a, a, couple guys, um, a couple guys in Australia. So they have a number of, uh, of uh, great features. So they have clinical cases, so this is uh, pediatric procedural sedation, the compound ankle fracture, isolated volar, uh, 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 volar distal ulnar dislocation, so like a drudge injury, um, uh, and a bunch of EKG um, things as well, and they go through the cases for you this is a, a great new feature called R&R um, &R in the fast lane. So this is research and reviews in the fast lane. So a number of us um, who are kind of online nerds, if you will, um, submit um, a weekly submit a list of what we're reading. Um, and then that gets compiled into a big long post of what everybody's reading with why we think, why we're reading it, why we think it's important that other people read it, and the, access, the, the PubMed link so you can easily get to the journal article. Um, and so um, um, this is a great way of, uh, of finding new journals and new articles to read. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything that's current. Um, it can be old things that you, you recently saw a patient with this and you found a good article that you think other people would like and that other people would learn from. Um, they have a bunch of uh, great procedural talks. So uh, this is Own the Chest Tube. I think there's also, uh, there's also Own the Bougie um, and a number of, other, uh, number of other talks out there. Uh, they have probably, I think, the highest quality um, EKGs on the internet um, with clinical cases for them as well. So you can either search by the um, EKG type, and so this is an AVR with a sodium channel blockade, or you can go and look just by case presentation, um, and they'll talk you through the cases, and uh, this is an example of, of some of their, they have an entire toxicology um, um, syllabus as well. So they'll ask you, this is for a verapamil toxicity, what specific therapeutic measures are available for treating verapamil toxicity? You click on show answer and it gives you their response. So you can kind of go through things as kind of a question and answer um, uh, evaluation as well. Uh, just some uh, more examples of, uh, you know, some of the fantastic images they have of the, um, here, and this is an ENT case. And then they have an entire uh, critical care drug um, reference. So they'll give you dosages, they'll give you indications, contraindications, side effects, things like that. Okay, more information. This is EM literature of note. Uh, this guy is an emergency physician and he uh, essentially just every post he reviews another uh, article that's somehow emergency medicine related, gives his spin, his take on the article. 
Uh, this is, uh, I guess there was a, um, a recent topic of, uh, you know how some people, you can do the jump test and that's supposed to irritate the peritoneum and if somebody, if a kid has an appy, they won't want to jump. Or you can, you know, bang on their uh, bang on their heels or bang on the stretcher and see if that bothers them. So unfortunately, this, this wasn't very good for um, ruling in or ruling out appendicitis. Uh, I guess I also, he also talks about the hamburger test. I didn't know that one, but uh, that's essentially you ask, hey, will you want to eat a hamburger? And if they say no, that's kind of like an equivalent of they have some anorexia or some nausea, right? Because some kids won't necessarily tell you that. Uh, so this is Dr. Smith's EKG blog. Uh, Dr. Smith is an uh, emergency physician at Hennepin County in um, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And this is uh, an incredible EKG blog. It frequently goes way above and beyond what I can completely understand that he's talking about. But these are uh, all emergency medicine cases, and he literally posts every EKG and the sequential EKGs they get to see the progression of the EKGs through time. Dr. Smith has a um, has a, a journal article he just got published um, that he actually has developed a formula using the height of the, uh, I think it's the height of the T wave and um, the duration of the QTC to help differentiate um, benign ST, elevate, benign repole from STEMI and uh, has a case series he's done this in probably four or 500 people. Um, so, and then he just uh, talks about all these different EKGs and the findings and what should be normal, what uh, shouldn't be there and what the differential is for all this. This is Michelle Lynn's blog. She came talk a couple weeks ago. So she has her tricks of the trade. Um, and uh, uh, I think Nick Kanan just had one posted a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can certainly email Michelle um, and uh, she will post your trick of the trade as well. Um, Michelle also has a whole section called Passus Verbis cards, which are um, uh, started out as index cards, but now you can, you can uh, just download them for your phone. Um, and essentially gives you an entire overview of what you need to know about different uh, number of different diseases in emergency medicine. She probably has about 50 of these and they are as, as um, um, as efficient and um, simple and to the point as you can get. They're really fantastic. Uh, this is the Trauma Professionals blog. So this is Dr. McGonigal um, at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and he's a trauma attending and just gives his take on a number of different trauma scenarios. So this is an interesting one. What if you thought there was a urethral injury but somebody accidentally put in a Foley already? So say you go up to look at the x-ray, there was some blood at the meatus and now, you know, an overzealous nurse puts in a Foley already. What do you do in that case? Do you pull out the Foley? And he says, he actually goes through the technique for how do you inject dye next to a Foley um, to actually evaluate and see if there's a ure urethral injury, what a normal should look like, what an abnormal should look like, and what you should do about it. Uh, Broom Docs, this is a uh, Australian emergency physician who lives out in the rural, rural countryside in Australia. Um, and uh, so, you know, he's in a developed nation, but he has very limited resources. He, um, he frequently actually does uh, elective um, surgical cases and uses um, inhalational gases for appies and stuff. He's an emergency physician, but they don't have anybody else to do it. So he talks about what to do with, with a number of different patients that you or I would easily say, well, just tube them and admit them to the ICU. So does he transfer them? The transfer is several hours by helicopter. Um, what does he do when he doesn't have an MRI scanner and a new study comes out showing that you know, CT necks, CT C-spines still miss a number of, uh, of injuries? How do you go through that? How do you, how do you figure out who, who you're gonna transfer and who you're just gonna observe? Emergency Medicine Ireland, uh, everything this guy says sounds so much smarter because he has an Irish accent. But um, so he's an emergency physician who took a year off um, this year to uh, teach anatomy to medical students in Ireland. So he's now fused his emergency medicine training with his anatomy training and has now put together a number of fantastic videos walking you through uh, CT heads, CT C-spines, um, and why, why what you're looking at matters from an anatomic perspective and also from an emergency medicine critical care perspective. Um, and uh, it's just a fantastic, fantastic um, number of videos. There's a bunch of podcasts. MCRIT uh, is Scott Weingart's podcast uh, in critical care. And um, so he has both a blog that he, uh, he talks about things and then he also has a um, uh, this uh, free, again, podcast that he can use that you can listen to at any time. Um, ERCast is by um, Scott Orman, who's just north in Portland, and uh, ERCast is also free, and it's essentially a 30-minute talk between, usually between a uh, 
subspecialist and, and Scott, uh, uh, sorry, Rob Orman, who is an emergency physician, asking an orthopod, hey, what do you worry about with distal radius fractures? Asking a, um, a colorectal surgeon, what do you do with internal hemorrhoids, external hemorrhoids? And going through a number of the questions that we always have on the phone, but the consultant's always frequently too busy to really answer all those questions, or it's 3 a.m. and they're not really excited to talk you through their approach to you know, the internal hemorrhoid or the anal fissure, things like that. Smart EM is by uh, a couple friends of mine in New York, um, David Newman and Ashley Shreves. They do what they call deep dives, um, reviews of a number of different interventions. So they've done ROGAM for um, first trimester vaginal bleeding. They've done um, the ACLS algorithm. They have talked about um, any number of topics. And they essentially go back to the very first studies that have ever been done in the literature talking about these and how do we get to today. So Rogam was initially you know, um, uh, used very differently than it's today and it's now given to everybody in first trimester bleeding and they talk about how did we get to this point? Is, is there data for what we're doing today? And it's a, a you know, very um, evidence-based resource that I love and is always frequently shocking and a little depressing that so many things that we do don't really work. Um, the ultrasound podcast is by a bunch of emergency physicians who are ultrasound trained, who are uh, very funny and um, very entertaining, but also provide some fantastic um, evaluations of uh, kind of like an in-depth talk on what they call diastology, so just looking at um, uh, diastole in a cardiac ultrasound. And then um, USC actually has grand rounds, or actually just their conference that they frequently stream every week. Um, Mel Herbert, who do also does... Um, uh, also does a podcast as well, um, frequently just post these. Um, and so every Thursday morning, um, especially if you're an attending, you don't work as much as a resident. Um, every Thursday morning, you can actually just log on and watch you know, five hours of, of uh, emergency medicine rounds. So apologies to Android users, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. These are all iPhone apps, but they're frequently also um, Android apps available for these. This is the only app that actually costs anything in this entire talk. Everything else I've talked about is completely free. Um, so this is uh, PDStat. I, I think a lot of you guys have this, because whenever I work shifts with you, I'm like, oh, get PDStat, it's the best. Um, so this is essentially, you can pu um, punch in a kid's uh, height weight or age, and it'll give you um, their calculated everything for anything critical in the resuscitation or evaluation of a, of a sick kid. So this goes for everything from uh, burns to cardiac resuscitation, equipment, fluid, um, blood resuscitation. It'll give you your dosages of, um, of procedural sedation meds. So this is good in a couple ways, but this is, this is also stuff that's in that, in that fine line of things that you need to know without having to look up the dose. So I use this, but I use this to confirm the dose that I already came up with myself. I make sure that what I calculated for the ketamine dose is similar to what this is saying. Um, just, but it's always a nice secondary resource because whenever there's a sick kid and you're, and you're panicking, it's very easy to miss decimal places and it's much better for you to double check and make sure you get something right before you push the wrong med. I chart, uh, I use this all the time. Anybody with a vision complaint, you hold this 14 inches from the patient's face uh, and you can get a quick visual acuity. Um, nerve whiz, so this is by a neurologist. You can punch in what, what? Oh yeah, oh is this, oh. Oh yeah, well. Now you don't need the Maxwell's. So uh, nerve whiz is fantastic. Nerve whiz, essentially, you can punch in a muscle that's weak. You can punch in a sensory distribution that's messed up. And it'll essentially tell you what, what nerve that is, what nerve root that is. Um, and it'll kind of give you, uh, give you more information about it. It's, it's really fantastic. Uh, eye handbook, so if, the, if you're working in a place that does not have um, ophthalmology, you can at least get a, a quick idea of what this patient might have. So it runs through any, uh, pretty much every ophthalmology emergency there is and gives you a quick idea about, um, so this is, uh, I think, definition, um, epidemiology, pathology, signs, symptoms, differential, uh, work, I don't know, I don't know what EX is, um, example maybe, workup, treatment, and follow-up. And uh, so if you, you know, you're not exactly sure what to do, this is a great resource. Uh, if you are into radiology, this is called eye radiology. So this is by a radiologist who has plain films, CTs, MRIs, I think some ultrasounds of a number of different findings. Um, and so uh, this is a posterior shoulder dislocation. So if you hit this labels button, 
All of this shows up and it outlines um, what you're looking at. If you turn it off, it obviously just um, shows you without it and then you can interpret it yourself. Uh, this is called Radiology 2.0, and then it's, I think it's Radiology 2.0, a night in the ER. So this is um, by a radiologist at Yale who um, was trying to develop a way to teach his residents um, who are, you know, doing the Yale's overnight reads for them how to read um, abdominal CTs. So this is, I think, 20, maybe 15, 20 cases uh, with uh, CAT scans that you actually just uh, scroll through using your finger to look through. And um, uh, it gives you a case presentation. There's a couple, you know, I think this is a 35-year-old um, male who presents with right lower quadrant pain and vomiting, and you're supposed to then look through the uh, look through the images and then click on answers. And then, of course, that's the appendicitis right there. Uh, toxicology, this is a completely free tox app. Uh, so toxidromes, antidotes, overdose management, everything is on this app. It's completely free. Uh, this is called One Minute Ultrasound. This is like nine different videos done by the same guys that do the ultrasound podcast. Um, and, and within one minute, they can essentially show you where you should be looking with your ultrasound probe, what kind of probe you should be using, what you're looking for on the ultrasound image. Um, and so this here differentiates cellulitis from abscess, and they're showing where their, um, where their probe marker is. Okay, so those were apps. Um, I think YouTube is a great clinical resource, and um, I know some hospitals are, have blocked it in the past, but I think it's a, a, obviously can be used for music videos and other things, but um, I think it's fantastic clinically. Uh, HQMedEd.org, this is more Hennepin County stuff. The, the Hennepin County guys are, are incredible. This started out as an ultrasound um, uh, clinical case website uh, where you can watch videos of their really fantastic ultrasound videos and what they find. Uh, and then it became even a, um, just a kind of overall clinical um, clinical uh, video presentation website, and this is the quality of images that you get on this website. Um, I mean, that's a bougie in through the cords. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible views and, and video that they have on these on their site. Uh, this is one of my friends, Whit Fisher. He does a website um, called Procedurettes, and it's also on YouTube. So Whit um, is kind of a uh, extreme version of Tricks of the Trade. So uh, Whit works in a community hospital in Rhode Island and frequently doesn't have access to all the nice fancy tools that we have here at Stanford. So this is how to make your own paracentesis kit. I think this is an 18-gauge needle, IV tubing, and a Foley bag. Uh, this is a, if you have a patient with, who's very impacted uh, and um, you can't manually disimpact them anymore and they're still very constipated, this is making an enema using a Foley bloom and an IV tubing. You actually put the, um, you put all the enema ingredients in an IV bag and then hang it up here. You push the Foley up the rectum, inflate the bulb so it keeps everything up there and then, um, and then you just kind of let them sit on it, let it brew and then they have a big BM and they go home. Uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Mellick, who works, I think, in Georgia, has a number of really fantastic, amazing videos um, of a bunch of different procedures. Um, he has a great video showing, like, med students what different types of retractions look like. Uh, this is him um, cleaning out a dry socket in a patient. This is him uh, doing a hematoma block for a, um, uh, for a boxer's fracture. Uh, and then I think you guys have probably seen the New England Journal. These are a little bit slower. Um, some are appropriate for emergency medicine. Some are appropriate for medical students. But good, very long, thorough overviews of the, the indications for procedure, the contraindications for the procedure. It's usually a little bit, I usually have to fast forward to the part I want to look at. But um, otherwise, it's a pretty good resource, too. Okay, Twitter. Um, so you can have conversations with your peers, which I think is really nice. So I use, um, I don't know about you guys, but I use Facebook for like my personal stuff, and then I use Twitter for my professional stuff. So I'm frequently talking with colleagues around the world about how we're managing different conditions. Just yesterday we were having a debate about sub, uh, uh, how, much, um, how much to start your IV nitro drip at for acute pulmonary edema. Um, you can frequently just very quickly reference an article that you're reading and have other people to discuss and talk about them. And then you can interface with um, your your peers, your uh, your role models, your mentors. A lot of people who give the you know give the huge talks at ASAP, Scott Weingart being one of them, are on Twitter, and you can frequently talk with them. And and uh, you know, I've had amazing access to these really fantastic experts just because uh, they're on Twitter and they're they're uh, you know they're always available to uh, to ask questions to. 
So I would be remiss if in this talk I didn't talk a little bit about social media guidelines. Um, this is becoming an evolving area. I think um, our generation has a very different idea of what privacy means and what privacy should be expected than um, older generations. And so it's, it's, a, it's something society is still trying to figure out right now. This is from, uh, these are some guidelines from uh, the Mayo Clinic who has an entire blog dedicated to medical social media. So all they do is talk about social media and medicine. So this is don't lie and don't pry. This essentially means everything that, is, uh, that you post online is very easy to figure out, A, where it's coming from, and B, if it's, if it's accurate or not. So don't lie and don't try to find information that, um, that you know you shouldn't be publicly uh, talking about. Don't cheat, you can't delete. So again, don't try to, um, don't try to um, uh, uh, you know, finagle your way through, um, through getting information you shouldn't have access to. And remember, everything now that you post online is forever. Google does not forget, Twitter does not forget, so if you have any hesitation, should I be posting this, just don't post it. It's so much easier than going back and, you know, people make mistakes obviously, but anything that you think you shouldn't be saying, just don't say it. Don't steal and don't reveal. So don't um, take information that's not your own um, and publish it as your own and don't reveal any information um, that's not yours. I know uh, we're all trained in HIPAA and all the different categories of information we're not allowed to talk about. One thing people forget about HIPAA though is that it also includes any uh, any possibly identifying inf information. So if a patient has a very particular tattoo that is very unique, you can't talk about that. That's still a HIPAA violation. Even if you don't mention their name or anything, there are, um, there are certainly, there are patients in New York who have very particular tattoos that say very dirty things that you cannot talk about because that's a HIPAA violation because there's only one person in the world that would have this particular tattoo. Similar with, uh, with dress or with, um, uh, say, you know, say there's a person who always wears a particular piece of clothing, um, that's still a HIPAA violation if you talk about it. If you, my, my guideline has, has kind of always been, if you need to discuss specifics to talk about the case, don't talk about it at all. If you can, if you can um, talk about the case in a generic way, consider it, but always, you know, always, um, uh, always be cautious and don't reveal any information. So finally, these are some tools to help you deal with all the other stuff I've been, I've been um, blabbering at you for the, for the past 40 minutes. So this is a thing called Google Reader. Um, Google Reader is how I read, I, so I probably read about 100 to 200 blogs a day. Um, and how I do it is I, re I use Google, yeah, everyone's getting looks like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a crazy person. Um, so Google Reader is a way that you can get through a lot of information very quickly. So instead of going to every one of these websites and seeing if there's an update, Google Reader takes all the information and puts it on my page. So I can very quickly click through every different article and skim through things and get through things very um, a lot quicker. And this is again, completely free. You essentially just subscribe to whatever blogs or podcasts or anything you're interested in. Um, and this isn't, this isn't limited to blogs anymore. This now New York, you can now subscribe to sections of the New York Times. You can uh, now subscribe to Google searches. So if you wanna check and see every time um, the words Bob Norris come up in uh, the, the Google News uh, search, you can actually incorporate that, incorporate that into Google Reader. Anytime that you um, have a package, you can now incorporate that into Google Reader and it'll tell you the next steps of what's happening with your package. Google Scholar is probably, I think a lot of you guys know about this, but this is a much better um, resource than PubMed for trying to search for, uh, search for PubMed related information. Um, Lane, our Lane library here has a bookmarklet. Anybody know what a bookmarklet is? Okay, so this is a bookmarklet. Bookmarklet is a little link that you can drag into your bookmarks tab, right, in your browser, right? Are you following me? And when you uh, and when you click on that, it does something. So in this case, you know if you're like at the New England Journal website and you're looking at an article and it says, oh, log in to view the entire article, or you're at any, any number of one of those other journal articles. So instead of having to like re-go through the Lane website, find the article again, and then re-log in, you click on this bookmarklet and it'll auto-log in for you. So it's one, it's one, ooh, ah. It will actually make you want to read journal articles. <laughs> Um, I've made a similar tool on my website. Again, it's in my um, a link. So if you go to another institution that has a similar um, uh, a similar proxy service like Stanford and a lot of other academic institutions have, um, you can essentially make your own bookmarklet. 
PubGet is an awesome tool, pubget.com. So this is a, a company that's trying to make PubMed um, uh, much more accessible for everyone. And so you, uh, it probably, I think, has the best search, even better than Google Scholar. Um, and so you can essentially type in what you want and you can set your preferences so that it knows, oh, well, I, Graham Walker uses Stanford libraries. And so it'll, it can immediately find a, um, uh, find articles for you and log you in uh, through Stanford. So you can just immediately download the PDF. And finally, uh, the University of Maryland Emergency Medicine Department has a daily emergency medicine pearl that they send out through email. Excuse me, that you can um, you can download for free. So every day I get a new email with a little pearl of information about emergency medicine. Sometimes it's an image like this. Other times it's um, so the one below it here. This is um, uh, a little summary about luxatia or erecta, the the your shoulder dislocation, like this. So here's how I use these in my practice. So uh, I had a patient a couple weeks ago. I moonlighted at, at Kaiser. Uh, one of my um, one of my colleagues had a um, patient with a hip dislocation, and he said, "Oh, have you heard about this new Captain Morgan hip reduction, hip dislocation technique?" And I said, "I have, but I I haven't I've never used it. I really want to." And he's like, "Oh yeah, let's do this. Let's let's try this." And th there was something about. Uh, you can internally and externally rotate the hip, but we weren't exactly sure about it. And it was, this was literally at 4.30 in the morning. So we went to YouTube. You Google Captain Morgan technique, and there's a number of videos showing you how to do this. And so we did that, and literally, if you haven't done it, it's incredible, it's super easy. Within 30 seconds, the hip is in and you're done. It's fantastic. Um, so I had a patient here a couple weeks ago who is a medical professional, and she worked with some other physicians. And she had a head injury, she had some LOC. And um, we initially were just gonna observe her for several hours, and she had talked to her, um, her, uh, her colleagues, and they said, oh, well, you passed out, you have to have a head CT, you must have a head CT. And, um, she, and she, was, you know, she was younger, and we were talking about the risks and the benefits of a head CT, and what, what we might find and what we might not find. And um, so I just went to uh, the NNT, this is my only self-promotion. So I went to the NNT, and we have these risk assessments. And so essentially you can um, give people an informed idea about what their approximate risk is of having something based on their GCS and, and a couple other um, criteria that they have to meet for this particular review that are just below the screen on the bottom. So after you observe them, they have a 99.92% chance of not needing, needing a neurosurgical intervention and uh, a very, very, very small number um, need something after that four to six hour observation period. And she went home without a, uh, without a CAT scan. Um, I had a patient a couple weeks ago with a rash on the palms and the soles, and you know there's always that differential for that, right? But I can always remember like four out of the five or five out of the six, I can't remember all of them, and so, uh, and this seems to always happen, but I had just gotten an email the week ago from the, the email, the Emergency Medicine Pearls website listing these things, and so what did I do? Well, I just logged into my Gmail, and I searched for UMEM, which is University of Maryland Emergency Medicine, Palms, and there it is right there. So, that could, so I could kind of quickly narrow down my differential. Okay, so finally, the future. Um, so I think research is gonna change. Um, so um, I think research is, is going to be um, done in a, in a new way, and I think um, some of the other online folks think this as well, that um, uh, some research will now be um, talked about online, and the, the idea or the method or the study will be refined through multiple people discussing it, and then once you have a refined research question or refined research topic, then that will then go into a study, as opposed to, Oh, this one center came up with this idea, we tried this, and now we have to see if it applies to a, a number of different centers. You can actually do research with social media. So the New England Journal is getting into this. It's the 200th anniversary of the New England Journal this year. And so now they're um, talking about social networking on the internet. Uh, Annals had published a couple years ago about emergency physicians tweeting Twitter. Um, this is an interesting study where, and. What an easy study. You go on Twitter, you type in antibiotics, you click search, and then you just analyze what people are talking about, about antibiotics. Are they talking about, oh, well, yeah, I got antibiotics for my cold. Are they talking about, I got diarrhea, I got a rash, I have an allergy, I don't need them, they make me nauseous, um, and they got published for just doing that analysis. Uh, this is kind of a next step. So Scott Weingart is, uh, has this idea that um, he wants to hear about people's critical care cases HIPAA protected, of course, and then uh, he's going to get. He can then give you feedback about how you manage the case, what he would have done 
similarly or differently. Um, and so you can essentially submit a case to him and then he, uh, with what you did and your, your impression, and he can give you his take on things. So an expert, kind of moving back to that, that CME idea of having an expert being able to talk to you um, about different things. So I think academics are gonna start to recognize online contributions as part of the publisher parish um, uh, kind of world. Uh, I know at Mount Sinai, um, this is now, online contributions are now recognized um, just like uh, offline publications are as well. Um, and there'll be more and more cultivated resources. So this is, the information overload is only gonna get worse because I'm going to encourage you guys to contribute as well. So there's only gonna be more people talking, more people um, trying to contribute, and more people getting excited about this stuff. And so it'll, it'll more and more become um, uh, cultivating, uh, cultivated resources that people have, like leaders in the field have said, oh, you should be reading this and this and this, and probably through some crowdsourced um, source method to figure out what, um, what, you, what you should be talking about. And I really like contributing to this stuff. I think you guys should too. There's a couple reasons. Whenever you talk about something or you have to teach something or write about something, you learn it a whole lot better than if you just read the article yourself. Um, and it's a great way to get involved in uh, a kind of a new community. It's really easy to get involved. It takes you very little to know, um, to know kind of startup time and uh, you can, and it, there's no real cost. If it doesn't work for you, you can stop. That's my talk. What questions do you guys have? Yeah. Oh, it's in the, my Tumblr. I'll, uh, I'll email it to you guys, yeah, yeah. Yeah, every, like literally everything I ever took a screenshot of or I posted or whatever, it's all, um, it's all on Tumblr. Yes. Oh God. Um, a couple. It, it just, it totally depends, like, um, <laughs> It totally depends. Like, um, I mean, I partially I like doing this stuff. So I probably do of of medicine related stuff. I maybe do eh, an hour. But I have a you know I read a bunch of other things too. I read about web design and other things that I waste my time on. So okay, thank you guys.